The story that you are about to hear is a compilation of documented true facts, featuring characters, events, or places that has played a role in shaping history. Please sit back and listen as I recite this narrative for you. Oscar Slater, who was wrongfully convicted of murder and sentenced to death, was released after nearly two decades of hard labor at Scotland's HM prison Peterhead thanks to the efforts of numerous journalists, lawyers, and writers including Sherlock Holmes author Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Oscar Slater was born Oscar Joseph Lechner on January 8, 1872 in Germany to a Jewish family. In 1893 or 1894, he traveled to London possibly to avoid military service and worked as a bookmaker before establishing himself as a precious stone dealer. After settling in the United Kingdom, he went by the surnames Sando, George, Anderson, Smith, and Slater. He appears to have used the latter for official purposes. In 1896, he was charged with malicious wounding, and in 1897, he was charged with assault, but he was acquitted in both cases. Slater moved to Edinburgh in 1899 and was living in Glasgow by 1901. He claimed to be a gymnastics instructor and a dentist at various times, though his business interests in jewelry persisted, and others suspected he made a living as a gambler. He was only a few blocks away from Marion Gilchrist Street in Glasgow at the time of her murder. Marion Gilchrist, an 82-year-old wealthy lady, had been living quietly at 15 Queen's Terrace, West Prince Street, with her one young maid servant, Helen Lambie. The crime took place in Glasgow on December 21, 1908. Helen Lambie, the elderly Miss Marion Gilchrist's sole servant, left her employer for a few moments to get a newspaper. Mr. Adams, Miss Gilchrist's downstairs neighbor, had heard three knocks on the ceiling and had gone out of his flat to investigate, thinking Miss Gilchrist needed his help. Adams rang the bell when he arrived at Miss Gilchrist's door. Despite the fact that no one came to the door, he heard noises inside the apartment. He went downstairs again but his sisters urged him to check on Miss Gilchrist one more time. When he returned upstairs, he saw a man hurrying down the stairs. When Helen Lambie returned from her errand, he was standing in front of the door. As Lambie re-entered the building, she saw the same man heading down the stairs. However, neither of them thought it was unusual. It could have been another tenant or a visitor. In any case, Adams informed Helen of what had occurred and the two of them entered the apartment. They were shocked to learn that Miss Gilchrist had been bludgeoned to death. Her personal papers had been rummaged through and a crescent-shaped diamond brooch had been stolen. Miss Gilchrist's assailant was obviously familiar to her as there was no evidence of a forced entry and he was presumably aware of their routine. There was a public outcry in response to the heinous murder. The police and the general public wanted the crime solved quickly and the murderer apprehended. Within five days, the police announced their search for a suspect. Although Adams and Lambie's description of this fleeing person did not match, the police immediately suspected Oscar Slater as the murderer. They already knew him as a shady foreigner who hang out with prostitutes, thieves, burglars, and resetters. They also had reason to suspect that he was running an illegal gambling den. Before coming to Glasgow, he had already been charged with malicious wounding and assault in London, as well as disorderly conduct in Edinburgh. At first glance, it appeared that the cops had apprehended their suspect. Miss Gilchrist's home was close to Slater's. The police were aware of his involvement in an illegal gambling operation. He found a diamond brooch not long ago. Even more damning was the fact that Slater fled the country under an assumed name shortly after the murder. On Christmas Day, he checked into the Northwestern Hotel in Liverpool with a female companion before boarding the Lusitania bound for New York the next day. Tickets for the crossing were booked with Connard Line through Toss, Cook & Son in Glasgow on December 23rd in the name of Mr. and Mrs. Oscar Slater, but were issued in the name of Mr. and Mrs. Otto Sando. When he arrived in New York, the cops were already waiting for him. Slater eagerly returned when he learned of the allegations against him and he was immediately taken to the Thoms prison, where he penned an impassioned letter to his friend, Hugh Cameron. He was certain he could prove his innocence. He found a brooch that did not match the description of Miss Gilchrist's brooch. 
He also had witnesses who could testify as to where he was at that time. Slater's evidence did not sway the police. They were certain he was the perpetrator. In addition to Slater's criminal history, the cops had eyewitnesses. A 14-year-old girl, Mary Barrowman, who was walking down the street at that time, noticed a man hurrying out of the building. Following some coaching from the authorities, these witnesses, including Helen Lambie, were convinced that they had seen Slater flee the scene of the murder. In addition, police believed that they had found the murder weapon after discovering a small hammer in Slater's possession. The trial took place in May of 1909. Despite the contradictory evidence, Oscar Slater was found guilty of Marion Gilchrist's murder and sentenced to death. Slater's attorney started a petition pleading for mercy. Slater's sentence was commuted to life in prison two days before he was scheduled to die. He was taken to Peterhead Prison in Scotland's Northeast, where he remained for the next 18 and a half years. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was also contacted by Slater's lawyers. While Conan Doyle did not approve of Slater or his lifestyle, it was clear that he was not Marion Gilchrist's murderer. Conan Doyle published the case of Oscar Slater in 1912. It examined the evidence presented at the trial and proved Point by point, the Slater was not the murderer. Conan Doyle, for example, explained that Slater traveled under an assumed name because he was traveling with his mistress. And while Slater did have a small hammer, it wasn't large enough to inflict the kind of wounds Miss Gilchrist had received. According to Conan Doyle, a medical examiner at the crime scene determined that a large chair dripping with blood appeared to be the murder weapon. Conan Doyle also concluded that Miss Gilchrist had paved the way for her murderer. He deduced that she was acquainted with the murderer. Miss Gilchrist and Oscar Slater had never met despite the fact that they lived in the same neighborhood. There were more calls for a retrial in 1914. One of the original investigation's police officers, Detective Lieutenant John Thompson Trench, revealed information implicating one of Miss Gilchrist's relatives that he claimed had been withheld by the police since 1909. Trench was fired from the police force as a result of this revelation. New evidence had surfaced. Another eyewitness was found who could confirm Slater's whereabouts at the time of the crime. It was also discovered that before Helen Lambie identified Slater as the man she saw in the hallway on the day of the murder, she had given the police another name. Surprisingly, the officials decided to put the matter to rest. Conan Doyle was furious. Conan Doyle repeatedly brought up the injustice against Oscar Slater over the years. His efforts were not successful. William Gordon was released from Peterhead Prison in Scotland in 1925. Gordon smuggled out a message from a fellow prisoner, Oscar Slater, and Binnells to the authorities. The message, written on waterproof paper and hidden beneath Gordon's tongue, was a request for assistance. It was destined for none other than Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Years before, Conan Doyle had heard the name Oscar Slater. Once Slater was sentenced to death for the murder of Marion Gilchrist, he became aware of the case. Oscar Slater made no new revelations. There had been no new evidence. It was only a note from a desperate man seeking justice. He pleaded with Conan Doyle not to forget him and to try again to free him. Conan Doyle couldn't turn down Slater's sincere request. He unleashed a new barrage of letters. He wrote to influential friends, the press, and Scotland's Secretary of State. He made public appearances and began to rally other supporters to the cause. The movement gradually gained traction. The publication of a book by Glasgow journalist William Park in 1927 was a watershed moment. The documentary, The Truth About Oscar Slater, cast new doubts on the veracity of the verdict and by the end of the year, Slater had been released on license but had not been granted a pardon. Park arrived at the same conclusion as Conan Doyle many years ago. Miss Gilchrist most likely knew the murderer and invited him to her home. Park suspected Miss Gilchrist had a disagreement with this person over a document she possessed. She was pushed and hit her head during the argument. Her assailant was then compelled to make a choice. What could possibly go wrong? To have Marion Gilchrist recover from her injuries and charge him with the assault or to kill her and be done with the matter. Park believes the assailant chose to kill Gilchrist. Park was not allowed to name the murderer in the book due to libel laws, but he believed the murderer was the victim's nephew. 
The book caused quite a stir. The case was covered extensively in the media. Witnesses came forward to talk about how the police coached them into naming Slater as the man they'd seen around the building that fateful day. On November 8, 1927, the Secretary of State for Scotland issued the following statement. Oscar Slater has now completed more than 18 and a half years of his life sentence, and I have felt justified in deciding to authorize his release on license as soon as suitable arrangements can be made. Oscar Slater was set free in a matter of days. Unfortunately for Conan Doyle, the case did not have a completely happy ending. Slater was released rather than pardoned. As a result, the case was reopened and retried. At that point, Slater could seek compensation from the government for the years he had been wrongfully imprisoned. Conan Doyle and others contributed to Slater's legal fees. Slater was eventually acquitted of all charges and awarded £6,000 in compensation. Conan Doyle assumed that Slater would pay his supporters legal fees. It was, after all, what Conan Doyle would have done. Slater had a different perspective on the situation. He thought it was absurd that he had to pay court costs at all, and thus he should not have to pay them back. Conan Doyle didn't need the £1,000 that he had given for Slater's legal fees. What bothered him was that Slater seemed ungrateful for the support that he was given. In 1936, he married his second wife, Lena Wilhelmina Schad, and continued to live quietly in error. Both were briefly interned as aliens at the start of World War II, but he later applied for naturalization in 1946. He died on January 31, 1948 at the age of 76 at 25 St. Philan's Avenue Air and was described on his death certificate as a retired journeyman baker. And as for the murder of Miss Marion Gilchrist, this still remains unsolved to this day. Hey everyone, I just wanted to say that I am incredibly grateful that you took time out of your schedule to listen to my narration. This is Naki of Twisted Mind, wishing you a great rest of your day. Salamat.